Hi everybody, I am coming to you live from Madison, Wisconsin, and my name is Carolyn Byers, and I'm the Director of Education at Madison Audubon. And usually I'm out in the field teaching. So I visit schools and community centers around Madison, Wisconsin, and I usually reach about 200 to 300 kids a week. Uh, so, but that's not possible right now. Uh, so instead, I'm trying to find ways to reach all of you through the internet. So here I am today, and we're going to be talking about furs. But first, I want to share with you some information about our new page, Safer and Funner at Home. So our governor wants us to be safer at home, and we think we should be safer and funner at home. Uh, so if you head over to madisonaudubon.org and look at our education pages, um, you can find our safer and funner page. And that's full of games and activities, and we're gonna be adding more to it all the time. Um, and it's all for kids and some adults who just wanna connect with nature a little more and need some ideas. Um, and all of these activities can be done at a safe distance from other people. You can do them in your home, in your yard, at a local natural area. Um, and as long as it continues to be safe to go out to parks, you can definitely go there. Um, but check, check to make sure they're open before you head out. Um, anyways, all right, so check out the Safer and Funner pages and I hope you love them. Um, but today, like I said, we're gonna talk about animal furs um, and Animal furs are so cool, um, the furs themselves, because it lets you see and touch an animal that usually we don't have access to. Usually they're wild animals and we shouldn't get too close. Um, but I really like uh, animal fur, not necessarily you know a skin, a fur like we think of it, but just little pieces of fur, um, because you can find those out when you're hiking or when you're exploring, and it lets you be an animal detective, a nature detective. Because uh, we know that those animals were there, they're in the area, even if we can't see them. Um, and there's a lot of good places to look for animal furs. Um, sometimes, or <laughs> not furs, but their fur. Um, you can find them on barbed wire fences a lot of times. So on, in Wisconsin, in a lot of our natural areas, it was land that was donated um, by people who, you know, used to, used to farm it, used to own it. And so sometimes you find barbed wire fences out there um, and animals have to either go under or over them. Um, and if they're a really furry animal, sometimes when they go under, little bits of fur get caught on the barbed wire and it, it doesn't hurt the animal. It's like when you run your fingers through your hair and some comes out. Um, and so you can find little pieces of fur on there and see maybe who has been in the area. Um, you can find those on thorn bushes too. So if there's blackberry or raspberry bushes around, you might find animal fur connected to it. Um, and where else? Oh, if you find an animal that uh, got eaten, you can usually find some fur or feathers there. So I often see rabbits and squirrels uh, that maybe fed another animal and you can look at their fur and tell who it is by, uh, by checking the furs out and seeing what color they are. Um, so that's one reason I love animal furs. It lets you play animal detectives. Um, and so I have five furs today and they were all donated to Madison Audubon by the Wisconsin DNR. So these furs were either donated by trappers or maybe they were trappers who weren't following the rules. And so the DNR took the furs that they collected. Um, so I'm going to hold up a fur and I am, let me see. I am able to see questions and comments. So if you have anything you want to share, even just to say, hey, I'm here and this is where I'm living, let me know. Um, oh, and I suppose I should say hi to all the kids that I usually work with. So if you are watching from Midvale or Lincoln or Mendota or Monona or Muir Elementary Schools, hi, I miss you and I can't wait to see you again in person. And same is true of Veracourt or Bayview or Goodman or Salvation Army Community Centers. Be well, everybody. Um, okay, so I'm gonna show you my first fur. And if you wanna guess what you think it is, I'm gonna talk about it a little first. So this is an animal that lives in Wisconsin. It lives in Madison. And actually it lives in most cities and towns with people. Um, so let me see, I'm gonna pan across the whole body. It's kind of big. Oh, that's a big hint right there. 
So this is how big the whole animal is. And this is what its tummy looks like. And actually, let me share a bit with you about the fur. So if you think you know what this is, type it in the comments, okay? Because I, I, want, I want to see guesses. Um, so the way um, animal furs are prepared is um, it's actually, they take the whole skin off the animal. And this is after the animal died. Um, so it is sad that this animal died, but it is really cool that I get to share um, this fur with kids everywhere um, because it's a really big learning tool. And when, I'm so sorry you guys can't touch these today because um, we're doing this through, through the internet, um, but usually kids get to touch them and feel them and it's a really neat experience. So it's sad that this animal died, but it's cool that I get to teach with it. Um, and so these furs, they're actually, they just took the animal kind of out of its fur. And so this is a little bit like a puppet. <laughs> um, but the skin is on the inside um, and the fur is attached to the skin, just like our hair is attached to our skin, our scalp. Um, and the way that this was tanned, tanning is what the process is called for preserving furs. Um, and the way that they're tanned, they're very, very soft on the inside. Um, and the fur is flexible. Um, and so it's, it's really durable and this fur could last hundreds of years if we take good care of it and we will. Um, and so this animal's belly is here and the back is over on this side and it actually, the face would be over here. So this one doesn't have the face or the nose on it. Um, it does have little ears. You can see where the ear, ear holes would be. Um, and the legs are not here either. So it's really hard to take the furs off of a long animal leg. Um, and so usually they just, they cut the fur right there. Um, so there's no legs. There is a tail. Pretty cool. Nobody has typed in any guesses. I'm so bummed. So I'm going to tell you, are you ready? It's a raccoon. <laughs> uh, so let me see if I have a picture of a raccoon here to show you. Um, where did you go picture? Here we are. So, oh, there's a lot of glare on there from my window. So these are raccoons and they are super, super common in all places where humans live um, because raccoons are really good at living near people. They are what we call generalist species. They're generalists in their habitat, meaning they can live almost anywhere. They can live near the edges of prairies. They can live at woodlands or oak savannas. Sometimes they hang out in marshes or swamps. Um, they do need a dry spot to sleep, um, but they're pretty comfortable walking around in wet areas. Um, and they also live right in our neighborhoods. Um, and that's partly because they're also um, diet generalists, which means that they can eat almost anything. Raccoons eat so many different things, mostly what they can catch, what they can get their hands on. Um, they would eat bird eggs and bird chicks, and they would uh, catch any living thing that they can really, <laughs> anything that they can catch and grab and eat, uh, they will. Um, they also eat berries and um, other sorts of plants, so they can find food almost anywhere. Um, they also eat our garbage. So if you have garbage cans outside or a compost bin or a compost, you know, compost spot, um, raccoons can make pretty good use of that. Um, and that's one reason that they live right near us, which is so cool. All right, so I am definitely going to come back to this guy and talk to you about him more. Um, but I'm going to put him, put him down for now. And I'm going to get another fur out. Are you ready to see? Usually I have kids guess what the next one is going to be, um, but I'm not going to do that today because the lag time is really hard. Let's see. What do I want next? Oh yeah, this is a really good one. All right. So I have, I have a fur. It's a really long fur. Are you ready? This is its head. This is where its front leg is. This is where its back leg is. This is its huge, huge, huge long tail. <laughs> So this fur is really, really long. There's the back, there's the belly. And actually, so it also does not have any legs. These are where the legs holes would be. But if I were holding this animal like this, its legs would only be about this long. So it is a super, super long body with very short legs. And you can see that this fur, see how I'm running my fingers through it? It's very, very short and dense. Let me do that with the raccoon so you can compare. 
So you can barely even see my fingers there as they go through the fur. So if anybody has a guess about this animal, type it in the comments because I want to know what you think. All right, so this animal, remember how I said the raccoon, its face was not on its fur? This one does have its face. So it has very, very tiny ears. They're all very dry and hard right now, so I can't move them for you. Um, but these are where the eyes would be. And the eyes on furs are removed because everybody, everybody very, very gently poke your eye a little bit. Eyes are very soft and they don't preserve well. So if we left the eyes in here, they would, first they would look like raisins, all shriveled, and then they would start to rot. So the eyes are taken out. Ooh, Katie guessed a beaver. I want to show you this long, long tail though. Do you remember what beaver tails look like? Beaver's a very good guess. This is an animal that lives in the water, it has very dense fur to keep it warm while it's in cold water. But beavers have really big flat tails. And Nancy and Katie, they, you both win. It is a type of weasel, but it's an otter. Um, and otters, they live in Wisconsin. I don't know of any in the actual city of Madison, um, but they love waterways and you can find them in lots of places in Wisconsin. Um, so we said this was an otter. Very, very cool. Um, oh, and I was showing you its face, wasn't I? Um, if you look closely, you can see its little dried up nose right there and its little whiskers. And they're very stiff, bristly whiskers. If anyone has ever felt a dog or a cat's whiskers, these are a lot stiffer than those. And shorter, very short. <laughs> oh, Kathy's celebrating for Nancy in the comments, and I love it. <laughs> so good. All right. Um, so this, like we said, this was a type of weasel. It's an otter. It's a very, very long, thin tube. All weasels have very long bodies with very short legs. And all weasels are very voracious hunters, and they eat so much food. Um, otters, like I said, they like to live in the water, um, and they live there all year long. Um, and they are active in the winter. Um, otters eat fish and crayfish and mussels and mostly things that live in the water because that's where they, they're good at hunting. Um, and they have this long, long, sleek body that makes them very streamlined in the water. And their tail acts as a rudder. It helps them steer. Um, I wish the feet were on this guy because they have big webbed feet that help them swim through the water. They're, they're very well adapted to living in the water. Remember how I said that the raccoon was a generalist? Well, the otter is more of a specialist. Um, and a specialist means that they are good at doing something special or they need to live or eat somewhere special. Um, so otters, um, they're, they can eat a lot, a lot of things, but it is special in that they mostly eat things that are found in the water. Um, and their habitat is special because they need to be in water, rivers or lakes. Um, but they can they can still live and eat a whole a whole lot of places, eat a whole live in a whole lot of things. <laughs> I don't know if I said that right. That's okay. Um, all right. So remember how I said that their fur was so so dense. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit more about animal the actual furs, um, their hairs. So animal fur is a lot like our fur, except that usually it grows to a particular length and then stops, um, kind of like our arm hair fur or fur hair. <laughs> our hair fur, <laughs> the hair on our bodies. The hair on our head keeps growing forever and ever. Um, but the hair on our on our arms, um, it grows to a certain length and then stops. And that's kind of like animal fur. Um, now animals, they have two two main types of fur, um, and they have guard hairs and your un your undercoat. <laughs> All right, so the guard hairs are these long ones. Well, they're kind of short on the otter, but they're long ones that go over the whole thing. They protect it. I'm going to show you on the raccoon because they're a little bit bigger there. Um, these, these hairs here, these, these are the guard, the guard hairs, um, and they're very, very long. And what they do is um, when they're in the right position, um, they sort of all move together to create like a raincoat. Um, so if water or snow is falling on it, it will go over the guard hairs and then fall off the animal. So hopefully, unless they get really soaked, the, the wet water or snow doesn't get down into the undercoat or into their, near their skin. So it still it keeps the animal really warm. So the guard hairs are like a raincoat for the animal. 
So I mentioned that they also have an undercoat. And the undercoat is like if we were to put a big puffy um, jacket or a sweater on underneath a raincoat. So these are little short hair. Oh, can you see that there? Yeah, that's in focus. Um, that are very dense. You see that light gray color underneath the darker brown? And that, that undercoat really helps keep the animal warm, but it's not very good at shedding water. So the undercoat and the guard hairs together keep the animal dry and warm. Hey, Angie, good to see you. <laughs> um, and here, let me show you. There is the undercoat for the raccoon, that dry fur. And you can see right there, that's the skin um, where I'm parting it. You can see it through, kind of like when we part our hair, you can see our skin through it. Um, that's, the, that's the skin of the raccoon. So we've got the undercoat and the guard hairs, and together they help keep the animal warm. <laughs> uh, all right, so we've got the raccoon, we've got the otter. Are you ready to see another one? Let's do it. Um, what should we find? Oh, I never showed a picture of an otter. How about I do that? So here's a picture of an otter swimming. You can see his nose poking out. They've got really big noses for their faces. Ah, oh, they're so cute. And let me see, do I have a picture of an otter? Yes, I do, it's whole body. Here's a picture of an otter's whole body. See how short the legs are? And they have a very, very long body. And this otter is hanging out in the snow. And my favorite fact about otters is that when they're traveling in the snow, they'll run, 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 and then they'll slide on their bellies, kind of like penguins do in the snow. And when I'm working with kids out in the, in the winter, we'll have them all line up and they'll do an otter slide. So I know it's, it's almost spring now and there's no snow, but if, if you have a slip and slide this summer, you could pretend to be otters and run, 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 and then slide on your belly. Um, and if not, you can wait until next winter and do otter slides. All right, so we've seen a raccoon and an otter. You ready for the next animal? This one is really tricky. Whenever I pull this fur out, nobody guesses it. All right, so I'm gonna pull it out and I'm gonna start showing it to you. And if you know what it is, please guess. So the first thing I'm gonna do is hold it up with the otter. So this is the otter and this is our mystery animal. And it's a little bit wider and bigger, but it's also very long, much longer than the otter. Well, maybe not much longer, but it's pretty darn long. It has a huge long tail, long, long body, this is a member of the weasel family, um, but it does not live in Madison. It lives up in the north woods of Wisconsin. And this one is very ferocious and pretty darn intense. Um, does anybody have any guesses? Any guesses? So I'm gonna show you a picture of the animal when it's alive. And actually, this animal is so hard to find that this was one of the, oh, a mink. That's a good guess, bigger than a mink. Um, this is one of the best pictures I could find on the internet and it's not a very good one. So you can see its face looks a little bit like a teddy bear. It looks very cute. Um, it has short legs, it has feet with some claws on it, but they're not really intense claws. It's got a big, big, long, bushy tail and it's in the snow. So this animal is very good at surviving in the winter. Um, you want to know what this animal likes to eat? It eats a lot of things because it has a really high metabolism and it has to eat all the time. But Laura, you got it! Dude, okay, so everybody needs to know that Laura is my sister. But she guessed a fisher. Oh, Nancy, a wolverine's a really good guess too. Wolverines are bigger than this though. Um, these guys eat porcupines. They're so fierce that they can eat porcupines. They flip them over on their bellies where there's less quills and that's where they, that's where they make the kill. Um, so this is a fisher and it lives up in the north woods of Wisconsin. They're super intense. So I'm gonna run my fingers through its fur um, and you see, see how long the fur is? I can't believe you guessed that. I don't think I've ever even told you that I had this. So it wasn't like you had inside information. Um, all right, so I'm running my fingers through its fur and you can see that it's longer than the otter, but shorter than the raccoon. Here, let me do this again. Here's the otter, super short fur, super short and dense, keeps it warm while it's swimming. 
And here's the raccoon, very, very luxurious fur, <laughs> nice and long. All right, so here's the fisher again. And this guy, you can see um, it's got an guard hairs that are sometimes reddish, sometimes blackish, sometimes goldish. Some of the hairs have all three on their, on their, their fur. And then the undercoat is that grayish color again. A lot of undercoats are gray. Very cool. We got the fisher. Let's see, fisher face. So these are where the eyes would be. And the ears are very folded over on this one. I can't move them for you. And there is his little nose or hers, I don't know. And it has longer whiskers. There, if I get them against my yellow wall, you can see them. Longer whistles, whiskers. They feel more like a dog's whiskers, not as stiff as the otter. Okay, so we saw an otter, a raccoon, a wolverine. Now I have a little animal. They live in Wisconsin. They live actually all over the United States. And this animal, um, its fur is flat like this. And it lives in our yards. Any guesses? It's very small. It's very soft. Actually, sometimes they can be pretty big. Maybe like this big when they're, when they're full grown. Um, and I'm going to, while I'm waiting to see if anyone has guesses about this one, it's so soft. I wish you could feel it. Um, I'm going to share a little, little story with you. So I got this fur from my dad. He's a fly tire. And that means that he ties flies to use as lures when he's fly fishing. Um, and <laughs> hi, Doyle. It's good to see you. Oh, Nancy, squirrel's a good guess. It's not a squirrel. Bigger than a squirrel. Shorter tail than a squirrel. Um, and so he would tie flies with this. And when I was a kid, I was really interested in all of the animal things that he used when he was tying flies. Um, and so I asked him if I could bring this into school and I wrote my name on it <laughs> three times <laughs> so that everyone would know it was mine. And I brought it in and I shared it with all my friends and I taught them about this fur. And now I'm here teaching you about this fur like 25 years later. <laughs> I think that's really funny. Okay. So no, oh, Nancy guessed it. I was just going to say nobody guessed it, but Nancy did. It's a rabbit. So this is a cottontail rabbit. Um, and... This is what they look like when, they're, when their body is in their fur. <laughs> um, and their fur is, is pretty long given the size of their body, at least compared to the other animals we were looking at. And they have a little bit of reddish behind their neck. And the rest of their fur is like a brownish on their back and it gets gray towards their belly. So because this is not a tube, it would be wrapped like this if it was like the other ones. Um, so they have a gray belly and a reddish back. Um, and let's see if we can see that undercoat. There's that grayish, grayish brown undercoat there. Um, and rabbits, rabbits are really soft. I've said it a few times. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna move on to the next animal because this one is my favorite. I always save it for last. Um, let's see. So this one is another big one. Um, and it has a very short tail. This tail is not, not broken, not cut. This is how long the tail is. Um, and this animal doesn't live in Madison. Um, sometimes people get pictures of them looking in their back doors, um, but that's usually up in pretty remote areas. So they live in Wisconsin, um, way up in the Northwoods. Um, occasionally they travel a little bit further south. Um, let's see, this is its belly. It has spots on its belly. Anybody have a guess? This fur, you ready, is softer than the rabbit's. Very cool. Um, here's its face. It has, hi, do you got it? Bobcat <laughs> it is a guessing game. Good work. <laughs> this is its little nose. Um, it's very dry right now. And you can see it has white eye stripes on it. Nancy, you got it too, awesome and pretty big whiskers. These feel just like a cat's whiskers. I mean, they are a cat, but they feel just like your house cat's whiskers. And here you can see its ears are folded over a little bit and it has that white spot on its ears. Um, and this animal would actually have very long legs. Um, cats have pretty long legs for their body to make them really good at jumping. Um, but it's, its little tail is, is short and that's naturally how bobcats are and that's part of their name. Um, so a, 
a bob haircut is a really really short haircut and it's this their tail looked like it was bobbed um, which means it looked like it was cut um, but they weren't this is just how they are little short tails let me see if I can find a picture of a bobcat here's a picture of a bobcat's face I think they look so cool really tough <laughs> and calm and here's a picture of its body see how very long the legs are they're very lean good at jumping yeah good at catching so does anybody know what bobcats eat oh, and you know what there's such a delay I think I'm gonna ruin the surprise <laughs> bobcats eat um, a lot of rabbits and snowshoe hare sometimes when they're up north um, they'll eat birds because they can jump and catch them um, and they'll also eat all kinds of small rodents um, squirrels and rats and mice and voles um, basically anything your house cat would eat plus some bigger stuff um, and that's a really good reason to keep your cats inside because uh, they eat a lot of animals. <laughs> um, so I'm going to run my fingers through this one's fur. It's got um, pretty long fur for its, uh, for its body. Um, and it's very, very soft and pretty dense. Um, and let's find that undercoat. There's that same color of the undercoat. And you know what? I am, I'm a bird expert and a sparrow expert. I don't know a ton about mammal fur. I mean, I know enough, but I'm not an expert in it. And I'm very curious about um, whether all animals have the same color undercoat. Um, because all the ones that I looked at today have this grayish color. Um, and I bet there's animals out there that have an undercoat that's a different color. But I'm really curious about why all of these animals had... I mean, they're mostly shades of brown and red, but they have different colored furs, but all of their undercoat is the same color. Um, so I might go and do a little bit more research online about that later today. I might, might do a little Googling. Um, so this was our bobcat. Um, let's see. So I'm about to the end of this, and I want to do something called eight-minute notes. And I've done that with kids in other online lessons and if you want to do that too what you need to find is a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil so while you all are getting your paper and your pen and your pencil or pen or marker crayon whatever you want to do um, I'm gonna do a little bit more talking and if you have any questions type them in now so I can answer them okay and we'll do eight minute notes very soon all right so I showed you the bobcat the rabbit the fisher, very long fisher, <laughs> uh, and the raccoon. And um, furs have been a really big part of human history for a long, long time. Um, back before humans could make a lot of synthetic materials and before we had, you know, big factories to make, make warm things, furs were really how we were able to survive in cold northern climates. So humans, we hunted our food and we used all of the animals that we could because it was really hard to, hard to catch them. Um, and so we saw how warm the animals were and we um, felt how warm the furs were. And so we used them to keep our own bodies warm and to make houses out of them and tents and blankets. Um, so animal furs really helped keep humans warm for a long, long time. And actually, even after we have, you know, big North Face jackets and parkas and stuff, a lot of um, native people, first people, um, they still use animal furs because they are warmer in most cases than the synthetic stuff. So native people living up in Alaska or northern Canada they'll often still be using animal furs. Um, and there's a lot of controversy now about whether or not people should be hunting animals or trapping them for their furs. Um, and some people think it's right and some people think it's wrong. And I'm not really here to talk about that. But I do want to mention that there is a pretty big environmental impact for creating the synthetic materials too. So it's true that no animals maybe were actually killed to make the synthetic jacket. Um, but there might be pollution or, you know, there were materials that needed to be extracted from the earth to do that. And animals probably died because of that. So 
really <laughs> humans impact the earth and we have to think hard about what that impact should be. Um, so animal furs have been a really big part of human history and it's really cool to think about maybe what our, our history would be like if we didn't make use of them. We would only be living in warm places. All right, so Nancy asked, can otters make a den above the riverbank? You know, I, the short answer is yes. Uh, so otters will dig dens um, and they live, they, they don't wanna be flooded, so they would be higher than the riverbank. Um, I'm not certain exactly where otters dig their, dig their dens. So maybe I will look that up and then I can post it in the comments after well, maybe later today, because I'm going to look it up while my kid's napping. <laughs> uh, does anybody else have any questions? What do you think? I don't see any more coming. So I'm going to get started with eight minute notes. Um, and if you, if you have your paper and you want to join us, please do. So the first thing we're going to do is um, write our name on the paper. And we are going to write the date on the paper. And the date is April 20th, 2020. And this is all gonna be reversed, isn't it? There's my name, there's the date. It's backwards. <laughs> and the next thing you're gonna do is make a giant plus sign on your paper. So you're dividing it into four, four sections. See the giant plus sign? All right, and we're gonna get two minutes to write in each one of these. Maybe draw two, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to start, pick a box. I'm going to start in this box and you're going to write something that happened, something that happened during this class. And it doesn't have to be something that I did. It could be something that happened where you are. So maybe the adult you're with fell off their chair. Maybe your little brother or sister kept on interrupting. Uh, or maybe there was something cool that you saw at the window while I was teaching. All right, so you're going to have two minutes to write this. Are you ready? And if anyone else has questions, please keep asking them. All right, I'm going to watch on my watch. Ready, go. Two minutes to write about something that happened. Maybe your internet cut out. That happens to me a lot. <laughs> I'm glad it hasn't yet right now. Oh. All right, let's see. So while we're waiting on these eight minute notes, oh, I wanna share one other thing about eight minute notes. These are just for you to keep remembering what we're talking about and to keep practicing writing because that's important. Um, but I don't want you to worry about spelling things correctly. That doesn't matter. As long as you can understand what you wrote here, that's the important thing. Um, and if you want, if you get done writing, you can draw a picture too, okay? All right, so we have, we're almost done with our first minute. You have one more minute. Um, oh, I'm gonna tell a story about some animal fur that we found on a field trip that I was teaching. Hi, Cherry, good to see you. Um, we were on an animal tracking trip in the winter and we were at the Arboretum, which is a really fun place to go birding if you're living in Madison. Um, you should check to see if they're open right now though. And we were looking for signs of animals and we were walking and we found a little bit of blood on the path. And the way it was spaced on the path, I thought maybe it was a coyote or a fox that had hurt its paw um, because sometimes that happens to my dog when it's cold and icy out and gets a little cut on his paw and he steps and he makes little bloody footprints. Doesn't hurt him for long, just a little bit. Um, and we have like 15 seconds left on this eight minute note. So keep writing if you want or drawing. Um, and so we were following this blood trail and then there got to be more and more blood. And so then I was thinking, oh, I don't, I don't think it's a hurt coyote or fox. I think it's something different. Five more seconds. Three, two, one, stop. Okay. So we just finished the first section of our eight minute notes. So now you're going to pick another box. I would pick this one and I'm going to write something, or I want you to write something that you learned today. Um, so on your marks, get set go. And it could be something you learned about furs or maybe a fact about one of the animals that we talked about. Maybe it's just a list of the animals we talked about. Um, maybe you were looking stuff up while I was talking and you learned something cool that I don't even know about. Maybe you should write it in the comments too if you want to share it with me. So we're writing for two minutes about something we learned today. 
And I'm gonna keep telling the story about that blood trail. So there was more and more blood in the snow and we were all wondering what on earth it was because we didn't think it was a hurt coyote or a fox. And then we found a bunch of fur <laughs> and it was a pretty bloody spot in the snow and there was a bunch of ripped up fur around it and the fur looked just like this. Do y'all remember what this is? This was our rabbit. And so I thought that a coyote or a fox killed a rabbit. But then I looked around and there was more blood and it was headed off in a different direction. So we started following that and there was more blood and more blood. And this is starting to sound pretty morbid, but I promise it was a really fun field trip. Um, and we have 30 seconds left to write about something you learned. And so then one of the people on the field trip looked at me and said, how much blood does a rabbit have? And I said, not this much. So we kept walking, we kept following it. And then all of a sudden there was a whole bunch of blood in the snow. And then the trail ended and we were all looking around like, what happened? Cause there were no other signs. Um, but then as we were walking out, we were very confused and a little frustrated. Oh, time's up. That was two minutes. I'm going to finish the story after we set up our next one. Okay, so now you're gonna pick one of the bottom boxes and we're gonna have two minutes to write something that somebody said. It could be something that I said. Um, and it could be something that someone in your home said. It could be something that you said. Um, but remember, oh, start writing, <laughs> start writing now. <laughs> um, remember when you're writing uh, something that someone said, we wanna put it in quotes. And remember quotation marks look like two lines two lines like this on either side of it and you write what you want in the middle what they said and then at the end you could say miss carolyn said or mom said or dad said okay so we have two minutes to write something well we have one minute now to write something that someone said today and i have to tell you what it was <laughs> as we were walking out of the woods we saw a sign that said um deer control, deer herd control in progress, stay on the trails. And what that means is that there are too many deer in the Arboretum. It's a park in the middle of a city and they have no predators that hunt them. And so there were too many deer there and the Arboretum is a really special place for plants and deer eat a lot of plants. And so to keep the plants healthy and to actually keep the deer healthy too, um, there were hunters in there removing deer, killing deer, um, to make sure that everyone stayed healthy. Because if there are too many deer and not enough food, well, they'll eat all the plants in the area, but also then the deer would starve. Um, so that was a deer that was shot by a hunter and then brought out of the park using the trail. But it was so confusing for us because we were not, <laughs> we were not thinking uh, along those lines. Okay, everybody stop, that was two minutes. So for this final box down here, I want you to draw something. And you could draw anything that we talked about today or anything that you saw in your home um, while this lesson was going on. So start drawing now and you have two minutes. Maybe you wanna draw an otter or a bobcat or uh, a rabbit or a raccoon. Uh, maybe you wanna draw a guard hair and an undercoat hair. Undercoat hairs are much shorter. Maybe you wanna draw something you saw out the window. Maybe you wanna draw a picture of me. <laughs> maybe not. Um, anyways, while you're drawing, we have about a minute and a half left. I'm gonna tell you the rest of my story. Um, so I thought it was really neat being a nature detective on that trail. And it was really cool how, as we got more information about what was going on, we kept changing what we thought was happening. First, we thought it was a coyote or a fox with a hurt paw. Then we thought maybe a rabbit got killed and had some blood that was dripping out. And then things kept getting weirder and weirder and we knew it wasn't a rabbit anymore, but we didn't know what it was. And then we saw the sign that uh, the actual sign written by humans <laughs> that uh, explained all the animal signs we were seeing. Uh, and so that was really cool to be a scientist and keep changing our minds about what we thought was happening based on the information we had. Uh, and so I think that was a really good, really good way to practice being a scientist. 
Okay, everybody, we have just a little bit left to keep drawing. Does anyone have any more questions before we finish up? This was a really fun lesson. I love talking about animal furs. Um, I'm thinking of new ideas for classes to do, and I brought my microscope home. Uh, and I was thinking maybe we could dissect an owl pellet in a class using my microscope, my dissecting microscope. Um, or maybe I could go and find a pond and look for tiny little water animals, like really, really, really tiny. Um, and we could look at those while they're swimming around. Five seconds left. Four, three, two, one. Stop. Stop drawing. Okay. Eight minute notes are done. Thank you so much for doing those. Um, I had I had a lot of fun today and we're going to be doing more classes for sure. Actually on Friday at 1230 central time, we're going to be doing, I'm going to be doing a, a build a bird lesson and build a bird is another one of my favorites. And in that one, it's basically story time where we talk about all the cool adaptations birds have. And I'm gonna be showing pictures. I'm actually gonna be doing a Zoom lesson and I'll share my screen so you can see all the pictures. I won't just be holding them up like this because that's not as cool. Uh, but we're gonna look at bird beaks and eyes and wings and feet and talk about all of the things birds are able to do with that. And we'll talk a lot about generalists and specialists. But then at the end, we're all gonna get to color and imagine our own birds. So you get to pick like puzzle pieces, all of the adaptations that we talked about and make your own bird. Maybe you'll make it with goggle eyes and a basket beak and stilt legs. It's gonna be fun. So that's gonna be this week, Friday at 1230. Um, and definitely check out our Safer and Funner at Home because uh, there's a lot of cool activities there. And I want to remind everybody that all of our edu education programming is free for kids. We provide it for free. And if you have the means and you want to help us keep providing free programming, um, we're going to add a link down in the comments that, to our website and you can find the Donate Now button. And it really, really helps us keep this programming free because everybody should have education programming, especially about nature. It's so important right now. Nature keeps us calm and grounded and it's relaxing and we all need that. So until next time, everybody be safe, go see something cool outside. Take care. Bye.